Good morning. I'm Kim Newton from the Public Affairs Office at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. I'd like to welcome everyone to the second part of our program where you'll learn more about the first flight of the Space Launch System and the 13 payloads selected and how they will launch and deploy. You'll also hear from experts about the Near Earth Asteroid Project, or NEA Scout, and how this small satellite will reconnaissance an asteroid using a solar cell much like the giant one behind us and return that data back to scientists here on Earth. I'd like to start out by introducing our briefers today. We have Chris Crumbly to our far left. Chris is the manager of the Spacecraft Payload Integration and Evolution Office for the Space Launch System at Marshall Space Flight Center here in Huntsville, Alabama. Joining Chris is Leslie McNutt. Leslie is the project manager for the NEA Scout project for the program for the Flight Programs and Partnerships Office, also at the Marshall Center here in Huntsville. And next to Leslie is Les Johnson. Les is the solar cell principal investigator for the NEA Scout project located at Marshall also. We'll hear opening remarks from Chris, Leslie, and Les. Then we'll take questions from reporters in the audience. Next, we'll take questions from reporters on the phone. And you can also go ask questions using the hashtag AskNASA if you're following us on Twitter. Now I'll turn it over to Chris. Chris? Thank you, Kim. So 14 months ago, we sent Orion on a test mission on the heaviest launch vehicle, the most powerful launch vehicle that we had at the time, the Delta IV Heavy. That vehicle was able to carry Orion to an orbit of 3,500 miles above the Earth. But now that we have the exploration class vehicle, the Space Launch System, we're actually going to take Orion beyond the moon, 275,000 miles away from the Earth, to a place that we haven't been in years, actually beyond where humans have ever been. And with this capability, we actually have more capacity on this spacecraft. And so engineers were able to say, we can outfit this vehicle and carry more, more science, more payloads along with us. And that's where we're, we are today. We've been looking forward to this day for some time. We've been working behind the scenes to come up with these, these CubeSats and to offer these opportunities. And it's, this is unprecedented. To take a CubeSat class payload thousands of miles away from the Earth, out into deep space, and to actually conduct science. But even with these small payloads, we're starting to pave the way for payloads that are small and large to go on the space launch system. So it takes a very large rocket to, to, take, to get that energy to go all the way out to deep space. So the rocket itself, the Space Launch System, is 323 feet tall, about 10 feet shorter than the Saturn V, but 20% more, more thrust than the Saturn V rocket had with Apollo. And it starts at the bottom with the four hydrogen-oxygen engines, the RS-25s, the solid rocket boosters, five-segment boosters, both of which we derive from the Space Shuttle program to, to bring to the Space Launch System, a brand new core stage, 220 feet tall, and then hiding behind this cone is an upper stage called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. And you see the Orion vehicle, of course, here, the service module, and underneath the, the shroud, the Orion vehicle. And what connects it is a five-foot segment called the Orion Stage Adapter. And in that five-foot segment, and it's mocked up right here, this is full scale, this is what you would see if you were standing inside the Orion uh, stage adapter. Five feet tall, 18 feet in diameter. And this is a full-scale deployer of, of the CubeSats. And you can see in the model, we had room within the Orion stage adapter to put 13 of these CubeSats in, and then one extra spot for the avionics deployer. And that's what we're going to be taking up into the deep space. Now, this is the second of the Orion stage adapters, actually built right here at the Marshall Space Flight Center about three blocks away. So the first one flew on EFT-1 14 months ago, connecting Orion to the Delta IV launch vehicle. So this vehicle and everything that you're seeing here, things that we're starting to produce right here. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the Exploration Mission 1 and let's, I think we have a short video that we can show and depict what that looks like. So the vehicle blasts off all four engines with the solid rocket boosters. The boosters, as they did on shuttle, burn for about two and a half minutes. Then they'll separate. The core stage carries the entire vehicle on up into orbit. As main engine cutoff, 
the, the spacecraft will depart. And then the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will light its RL-10 engine, sending the spacecraft on into deep space on towards the moon. About 11 minutes later, the engine will cut off. We'll let Orion know that it's safe to, to, to separate. They will separate on their own power. And about 30 minutes later, we will start doing a disposal burn with the upper stage. Once it gets to a safe distance, then we'll, the avionics deployer will turn on and it will start deploying each of these CubeSats one at a time with a little spring ejection system to come outside of the system. And you're seeing right now where the CubeSats are inside the, the spacecraft. Once these systems deploy, they get a safe distance away from each other and from the upper stage. Some of them will turn on some novel propulsion like solar cells, like you see behind me and you'll hear more about. Some of these will go around the moon one will actually go to an asteroid, and others will be studying the environment around deep space. But we have worked in this field for several, several years. The Marshall Space Flight Center has been leaders in working with science and technology payloads and taking those up on the space shuttle and the space station. And the Space Launch System program asked some experts in the field, our flight pro pro programs and partnerships office, to integrate this for us, and they've been doing so. So I'm going to introduce you to Leslie McNutt, who is one of those experts. She's the project manager for NEA Scout, and she's going to tell you more about her mission. Leslie. Right. Thanks, Chris. So Near Earth Asteroid Scout, or NEA Scout, one of the 13 payloads that are hitching a ride on SLS. So NEA Scout, just like you've heard, is um, a 6U CubeSat. It's about the size of a large shoebox and will weigh no more than 30 pounds. So within that constraint is a fully functioning spacecraft. It's pretty incredible. And so you can imagine volume and mass are quite precious in that small area. So it's it's the most complicated game of test rush you've ever played, but a whole lot of fun for the team. So NEA Scout's going to give you both science and technology objectives. Uh, for science, we're going to image an asteroid, specifically 1991 VG. We're going to go by close enough, within about one kilometer, and slow enough to see a whole rotation of that asteroid. We're going to learn a lot about it. Uh, we're going to be able to fill in some of those gaps that scientists have about asteroids, and then that will be um, applicable to future missions to asteroids for really any number of things, including human exploration. The next thing that NEA Scout's going to do is show you a whole new exploration platform. It's a reconnaissance platform with its first target being an asteroid. That platform is enabled by our propulsion, the solar sail. So behind me, you see a half-scale solar sail. So our flight unit is going to be twice this size. So why are we in this facility, uh, you might ask? This is the flat floor facility. And as you might imagine, the solar cell is not designed to deploy in Earth's gravity. So how could we test that out? On the flat floor, we were able to use uh, air bearing technology, kind of like a, a puck on an air hockey table. So as we deployed the solar cell, it could just glide across the floor and we could check out exactly how that deployment would work. Because this is a pretty big sail. This, um, the sail that we're trying to build twice this size, we really need to figure out how best to make that deployment work. So 36 square meters, that's what's behind me. The flight unit will be 86 square meters and it's all gonna fold up onto this spool. So that's pretty incredible, right? So to tell you more about the solar cell and how it's gonna function is Les Johnson. He is the principal investigator for NEA Scout solar cells. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, the, the NEA Scout is gonna give us and demonstrate a new capability for exploration. And it's gonna be low cost reconnaissance of an asteroid. And why that's important is because someday we're going to want to send people to asteroids. And it's a good idea to get a lay of the land shot before you get there with people, as Jatendra explained earlier. We wanna know more about the target, what it looks like, what is its spin rate, does it have dust around it, and the sail is going to provide the propulsion system to let us do that. Uh, coming up on your screen is an animation of the mission sequence, and I'll walk you through what happens as NEA Scout goes to its target. Uh, the first thing that will happen is we'll be one among the 13 payloads that are ejected, and our small CubeSat will be deployed. As it moves away from the SLS, it'll go toward the moon, 
and deploy its solar panels so we can generate power and call home and give a status check of all the systems on board the spacecraft before we begin our actual mission. After we've been around the moon, we're going to deploy the solar sail. We'll do that by deploying four 24-foot booms, which will pull out the sail, which will be a larger version of what you see here beside, uh, behind us, and that will provide the propulsion system that will take NIA Scout to the asteroid. We'll then do another lunar flyby, get a little bit of a, a, a gravity kick from the moon to send us on our trajectory. Well, one of the questions people have is, well, how does a solar sail work? Well, a solar sail doesn't use wind, it uses sunlight. And this is a piece of the kind of, of the sail that we're going to be flying. It's about two and a half microns thick. Uh, that's about the thickness of a human hair. It's a plastic. It's got aluminum on it to give it lots of light reflectivity. And what happens is, as you're in space and you unfurl this, the light reflects from the sail. And even though light doesn't have rest mass, it does have momentum. So imagine light, particles of light, uh, photons, as being like little uh, ping pong balls bouncing off of this. And together, they impart a little bit of their momentum, and the sail will recoil and move. We steer by tipping and tilting the sail and changing the angle with which the light reflects from the sail. What that does is it changes the net direction of the force, or the thrust, that allows us to steer the sail in the direction that we want to go. Now this force is a very small force. It's, it's much less than an ounce per football field. You would never notice it. You can't feel this pressure. But as long as the sun is shining and our sail is deployed near the sun, we're going to get constant acceleration from that. Leslie mentioned that mass is king here. The key to this is a lightweight, low-cost spacecraft. Now, when we get near the asteroid, we have a camera on board. We're going to image the asteroid. We're going to cover about 85% of its surface. We're going to send that data back home, understand more about what this future target is, and demonstrate this capability that could be used to visit many asteroids relatively inexpensively. So you put it all together, and Exploration Mission 1 is going to give us an integrated capability in the proving ground to take the Orion capsule the Space Launch System, and demonstrate its capabilities. And along for the ride will be a new capability for low-cost interplanetary science and exploration by deploying these CubeSats. In the future, solar sails could be made much larger to do other science missions. Uh, they have the potential to, to do study the sun and to go to vantage points that are currently impossible with other propulsion systems. So I see a, a, a bright future, no pun intended, uh, for solar sails as this first flight for the United States into interplanetary space with our largest solar sail ever. Thank you, Les. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll take questions from reporters here in the audience, and then we'll take questions from reporters on the phone. If you're on the phone, please hit star one so that you can be entered in the Q&A queue, and then we'll go to social. So please limit your questions to one at this time, and please announce your name and media affiliation. So we'll start here in the room. Uh, Josh. Hi, uh, Josh Barrett again. Uh, my question is, is one of your goals going to be identifying candidates for the proposed asteroid redirect mission? Do you want to take that? Really, our, our goal is to, we've got this one target asteroid, to learn what we can about that asteroid. Now, that's the thing. There's a lot of things that scientists don't know about asteroids. So based on information gleaned from this mission, it could potentially affect um, the missions you then choose um, after this mission. Yeah, we're, we're, so, we're not going to be in time to affect the decision, I think, for the, for the, the asteroid redirect mission, but for future true. missions, it's a possibility. Any other questions? Uh, Lee, right here. Hi, uh, Lee Roop with AL.com again. Uh, just looking at your sail it, and the way you pulled it out there, Les, it looks kind of flimsy, a little thin. Uh, how, how strong is it, and what happens if something pokes a hole in it? Well, this material is very lightweight, and that's one of the revolutions that allows NIA Scout to happen. Is This is a, a polyimid. It's called CP1. It's very lightweight, but it's pretty robust. I mean, I could damage it if I wanted to tear it, but just handling won't damage it. 
And there is no doubt that when we're in deep space, we're going to get hit by micrometeors. It's going to happen. Uh, but the thing is, it's so thin, and they're traveling so fast, when they hit it, they're going to poke just a little teeny tiny hole in it and not deposit much energy. Uh, the same micrometeorite hitting a block of aluminum would stop and deposit all of its energy of motion. It would be like a, an explosion and be a lot of damage. But for us, it'll just poke a little pinhole. And in the off chance that we get a tear, uh, we're, we're like a parachute. We have ripstop. And so if there is a tear, the rift stop should stop it before it gets too big. Hey, any other questions? All right, let's go to social media. Thank you, Christopher Lair, uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center here. And one of our questions online is from Jay Rake at Young. Jay Rake asks, what materials or support will or does NASA supply each CubeSat team? So, well, I can... I can I'll let Chris talk about any integration um, type support. Uh, at least we're a team that is NASA funded, uh, so supported by HEO and AES, so we get that sort of support from NASA. Uh, I know that from SLS we get a, a large amount of support as far as uh, requirements from the vehicle and integration needs, and so we, we talk daily with those individuals to help us on the path to the vehicle. So each one of the, the, the groups, the, the mission directorates, uh, put out their, their own call, and then they, they self-fund each of those. And they, they're funded at different levels. But what Mr. Gerstenmeyer and Mr. Hill have, have offered is that we will cover the, the integration cost of putting it onto the vehicle. So we, we built in-house uh, uh, the apparatus to hold the deployer, and we ask every one of the units to use the same deployer so that we can be consistent on this first flight. Okay, uh, any other questions in the room? All right, uh, this concludes today's uh, second part of the program. If you would like to learn more about SLS, Orion, or NEA Scout, visit www.nasa.gov, or you can see the URL that will come up on your screen for uh, the materials that we have today. And thank you for joining us.